In this episode of the On Not Nitro, we're going to learn about the event processor host for Azure Event Hubs. Check it out. Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of the On.net show. And I have the folks from the Azure Event Hubs team joining me again. And we're going to talk a little bit more about event processing with Azure Event Hubs. So in, in our last episode, we talked about how Event Hubs specifically is used for very high throughput, Correct. you know, multiple consumers, multiple producers, right. um, you know, processing information. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So why don't we talk a little bit more in detail about how exactly we process that information and how the clients send that information. Yes, absolutely. Uh, so when you're talking about the receiving send or the consuming uh, part of Event Hubs, um, you have data coming into this big buffer, which is Event Hubs, and then you have uh, data being distributed in partitions, and then you are uh, thinking about how do I consume this. Now, we briefly touched upon, you know, okay, you have the event receivers and you're consuming uh, from all these uh, uh, partitions in the event hubs. Mm -hmm. So what happens or what we have seen is uh, when the data is very small, it's fine, but when you're, you're thinking of event hubs and you're thinking of scale, um, consuming parallelly among these at, at very large scale becomes uh, very challenging uh, because you're thinking of load balancing, you're thinking of uh, orchestrating your consumers. So what we have built is a simple uh, SDK, simple uh, orchestrator uh, called the event processor host, and um, that helps you with your downstream processing in parallel. Um, and Sarkant is probably going to dig deep into what components of event processor is. I mean, what is event processor host? What components does it have? And how do you, you take advantage of this simple orchestrator? OK, sure. So let's do that. So mm -hmm. Sarkant, what do, what so do we talk the about? So in the previous episode, we have seen how you create okay. an event template client. On top of that, you create the receivers, right? So mm -hmm. each receiver is now dedicated to receive from a single partition. OK. So when it comes to you know large number of partition scenarios, so how do you, you launch your um, like receivers and then start managing them? Mm -hmm. uh, so in order to solve this issue, we have a wrapper around the low level API, which is the receiver itself. So basically, you fire up an event up process rows, and then this process rows will go and then uh, start creating the receivers uh, and start consuming the messages from those receivers. And so when we when we create this processor host, can we can we determine or can we dictate how many receivers does it create, or does it kind of just create them based on some criteria? A processor host will do this. The first thing it will go and then discover how many partitions are available okay. for that uh, given event up, and then uh, it will create single receiver for each partition. partition. Got it. And then the implementation itself is uh, pretty much um, like straightforward. Uh, we have provided an iEvent processor, which the uh, developer will be um, uh, implementing their own uh, message handlers. In the process event async call, we ha hand over uh, the, uh, not the, all the messages that are received from the a particular particular uh, receiver. Got it. So even processor host kind of hides uh, how it's creating uh, or how it's talking to the low level uh, receivers. This is something that the uh, customers need not worry about. Got so it. it's just a complete wrapper. So what uh, the customers using, uh, even processor host would be worrying about is, how do I scale up my processor or consumers? How do I checkpoint? And what are the things that I need to checkpoint? And how, how does even processor host help me with load balancing my consumers? Like if I want to add more, if I want to remove, what will happen? How, how does it. the consume help? So, so in the, in the previous video, we mm -hmm. saw how to use like the client to actually say, hey, like you know, yes. receive this message, and we did that in yes. a loop. Exactly. So essentially, what this is doing is creating, uh, is managing an event loop for us. Essentially, you kinda? can you can kind that, of consider, but there are a lot more things. Uh, it's happening in yeah, the background. Yeah, in the background as well. Yeah. Okay. It's pretty much uh, this. This one is a single event processor. So when you fire it up, then it will just. Uh, create all the receivers. It will own all the receivers. Yeah. So um, it becomes more like a better solution when you start running multiple hosts. Yeah. So basically, let's say in order to load balance or you know distribute your processing loads to multiple, uh, let's say CPUs, multiple VMs, then you can uh, uh, just start hosts as many as possible, and then they will start sharing the partitions. 
Got it. Say, for example, I will give you an example. You are receiving from, uh, say, uh, 12 partition event up. And then if you start four process rows on four different VMs, so each VM will own uh, or b become responsible for only processing three of the mm. partitions. Got it. So could this be a s situation where I have something like Docker or Kubernetes, mm -hmm. right, and I might have an events host processor That's per, it will per pod or per container? Right, and now I, I spread these across like a bunch exactly. of nodes. Exactly. That's correct. Right. And then that's, that helps you it. if you add in more nodes. Mm -hmm. You can just scale up your consumer so that you're increasing your parallel processing. Yeah. And um, the, the idea is you're always, most customers want, you know, um, want to stream in near real time. So they want low latency, yeah. fast processing. So that's what this kind of helps. Got it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I think we can continue with the sample. Mm -hmm. um, once you create the event processor host with uh, by providing the a host name which needs to be dedicated, mm. so each uh, host knows uh, while checkpointing it uh, what, what type of you know, what partitions they're owning, and then event up name uh, where the uh, events will be uh, consumed from, the consumer group name, and then the connection string name, connection string as we know, and on top of that you need to provide. Uh, Storage connection string and the list content name, which will be used for uh, checkpointing and list management. Okay. So even processor host has this checkpointing mechanism uh, where it's just uh, checkpointing and leasing um, into a storage, into a separate uh, component. Mm. Uh, which for this, I mean, for by default, um, we use the Azure storage, Blob storage, uh, Blobs to define the leases and then um, checkpoint uh, and load balance among the consumers. Yeah. Um, we do have an option where if anybody wants to bring in their own store, um, they can have an interface, we have an interface that can implement and then um, use their own store for checkpointing. So the, the storage component is only for checkpointing and leasing. Got it. So that sounds for me mm -hmm. something very similar to what the folks in Gerbil Functions mm -hmm, do. Mm -hmm. I know they have a, a, a checkpointing mechanism, Correct. probably a little bit different to what you're mm -hmm. talking about. Mm -hmm. um, but they also use blob storage for, for, for yes. those types of things. Yeah, that's right. It's mainly for leasing and checkpointing. Got so it. it's easy when you are just taking your that load from your orchestrator and uh, maintaining it in a different store. Got it, got it. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. And All right, if you switch back to our sample, mm -hmm. so uh, once you create your event process rows, Basically, you should, uh, in order to start running it, you register it. And then register call will start and then discover the partitions, and then your host will start grabbing uh, partitions and create receivers on top of them and then start receiving. So yeah, basically, uh, you're trying to register a host into the service saying, hey, this is my listener, this is where my data from event hubs will be coming into. So yeah. that kind of a thing that's happening in the background. Gotcha. Okay. I love when we're recording videos and Visual Studio starts to spin. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, in this one, oh, it's, it's going very quick. So you're running the event host right now, right? Yes, that event processor right. host, and it's trying to receive from all the partitions, yeah. as if I'm seeing it right. Yeah, <laughs> since we are, we were already running this sender for a while, so yeah. it accumulated a lot of messages. Messages and so, so it's this single spinning, processor yes. host now trying to you know, grab every message available and then process them. Right. And like we were saying earlier, if you wanted to scale this up or scale yes. this out a little bit, yes. now I could just spin up some additional nodes with the same... You know, yeah. Yeah, I would like to show that. that. Yeah, probably just you know bring up another event processor host and then uh, another instance of the processor host and then uh, you can see how the lease just gets yeah. grabbed. Yeah. As you can see on the left side, our sender is still running. On the right yeah. side now, our processor host is running yes. at the same pace. So every time we send a message, it it's is appearing in one of the partitions, mm -hmm. and then our uh, processor host is grabbing it. It's and almost like there is no latency there. <laughs> yeah, that's right. right. And what if we spawn another uh, instance. instance of processor host? I'm going to just use executable to set another one, a new one. So once I start the new processor host, so it registers itself. And then, as you can see, it starts grabbing one of the partitions. Yes. So basically, it's doing yeah. some sort of load balancing. Yeah. Got so this, the first time I ran as a single processor host, it owned all four available yes. partitions. Right. And you can see that uh, that partition uh, in the previous window, you can see that partition one is being grabbed by the other host. Yeah. Right. As you can see, yeah, second host, once we start, it first grabbed partition three, 
and then start receiving from partition tree. Yep. And then after some time, uh, it decided, no, it's not there yet. It needs to grab another and one, so one. make uh, it even. So each host will own two partitions in yep. the end. Okay. So it grabbed partition two as well. Yeah. As the new host is grabbing the partitions, it's still in the partitions. As you can see on the first source, it says Liz lost. It means yeah. it lost the partition. So it sure. stops receiving from that partition. So once they reach a balanced state, uh, as you can see, the first host we spawn uh, is owning partition zero and one. As you can see, uh, it's receiving from zero and one. And the second one is receiving from two and three. So if you add one more host, it'll start balancing among three. That's right. right. So. And let's say another scenario is what happens if one of those crashes, right? So or stops processing. So let's say we stop this one. And then you can expect the um, leases to expire. And the, this single host the running alone now well, finds out that no one is receiving from this partition. So I should start a partition pump or start yeah. receiving from this partition. From that particular yeah. partition. Yeah, it will take a little bit of time depending on your uh, configuration for the processor was. Yeah. By default, uh, our lease duration is 30 seconds, mm -hmm. so it takes 30 seconds for the lease to expire. OK. So one of the things I was wondering about when you're showing it is, is there like an optimal balance between the amount of partitions you have and the amount of host processors you have? Like so for instance, it we saw that there were three partitions, right? And when you spun up an extra host, like one host had like one and two, and then the other mm -hmm. one had three. Yeah. So what if I had like three partitions, and like I had five yeah, Post. I would step back a little bit and say the governing factor with event hops is throughput units okay. uh, or the amount of bandwidth that you have reserved. Mm -hmm. So if you have reserved one throughput unit, what it entitles you is 1,000 1 KB messages or 1 MB per second mm -hmm. of ingress okay. and 2 MB or 2,000 1 KB messages per second of egress. Okay. So if you were to use event processor host to consume from your event hops, no matter how many partitions you have, no matter how many hosts you have, the max that you can egress, if you have one throughput, is two, That's two true. MB, two Got MB it. per second. One through, so as a as a golden rule of thumb, what we say is um, mark your partitions or decide on your partitions based on the number of throughput units that you would want to reserve or buy. Right. And based right. on your uh, partitions, you can decide how many consumers, or how many house hosts, how many, how do you, how fast and how uh, quickly uh, you want to scale up and use your consumers. So it kind of influences from throughput all the way to okay. your processors. Yeah, that makes sense. So mm -hmm. as you can see, after uh, stopping the first host, now the second host is owning all the partitions. So basically, it's receiving from all four partitions available. Got it. Yeah. Okay. Cool. That looks interesting. So is there anything else that you'd like to tell us about the um, the event host processor? I think that's pretty much it. That's about I'm it. Sure I might have. So I know a lot of folks are probably going to be looking at this video and wondering, well, where can I get this code and where can I see the samples? So we got to make sure that mm -hmm. you know, post video, yes. we're going to have these on GitHub somewhere yes. or some public repository. And we'll add it to the show notes too so people can uh, check it out. Absolutely, yes. Cool. For sure, yeah. Well, uh, there's one uh, thing that we always recommend mm -hmm. is when you're consuming, we always uh, ask our customers to use the EPH way or the event processor host way of consuming rather than the direct receivers. Yeah. Um, we have direct receivers when you're thinking of building some kind of a connector, like you know you want to build connector between uh, your Spark uh, streaming and your event hubs. Like you have yeah. data in your event hubs and you have a Spark cluster, and I want to kind of a connector to kind Connected of do to. this. So some kind of a connector, some kind of a heavy body uh, implementation that you are building. Uh, your low level uh, receivers help a lot. Otherwise. Um, all the load balancing, all the checkpointing that you need to take care of, um, EPH kind of offers you that. Right. So um, that is that is like a best practice or recommendation from the product group that we have. Cool, awesome. Mm -hmm. Actually, and as you were saying that, uh, mm -hmm. another scenario kind of popped mm -hmm. into my head. So, do we have like Azure Functions bindings for these things? Like, yes. Can I have my um, you have the uh, yeah. Azure Functions consume this thing and yeah. then I could push that out to my Spark That's right. if I wanted That's to? That's right. And uh, Azure Functions also, in the background, uses even processor host ah, okay. uh, the uh, the binding, uh, Azure Function binding from Event Hubs to Azure Functions mm. is kind of using the e EPH as well. That's great. So if I mm -hmm. wanted to, to do this in a serverless way, mm -hmm. then you know I, I won't necessarily yes. have to write that event processor host code. Exactly, yes. You know, it's kind of just already built into the, the platform. So that yeah, works out great. Absolutely, that's great. yes, that's right. Cool, awesome. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you all so much, man. This is this is a lot of great information. 
And thank you all thank for you. watching. This is another episode of the On.NET Show. We learned about how we could use the event host processor for Azure Event Hubs in .NET.